Other questions? Thank you very much, Chair. I'd like to, and I appreciate uh, the participation and attendance of all those in the committee. Mr. Chair, might I start by saying um, this whole thing is the whole intermittent power issue is a swindle. It's a swindle and it's nomenclature. They mention farms. There's nothing like farms. They're future obsolescence. They say renewable, when we all know in the end they end up as landfill. It's an environmental swindle. It's the biggest industrial metamorphosis that the New England has ever seen of their landscape and uh, the nature of the area. Even in this environmental swindle, our LPA agreement, which I am um, a part of as a beef producer, uh, we have to sign that we have a management plan to restrict stock from grazing near uh, wind towers and near solar panels. I presume this is on the same premise as the pre concerns they have with such things such as PFAS, but in this issue it will be th such things as microplastics, bisphenol A, cadmium and lead. It's a swindle in far as the decommissioning goes. It promises a virtue, but it doesn't tell you how they're going to get rid of it. Senator Murray Watt, Labor Party Senator Murray Watt from Queensland, was quite uh, precise when he said, uh, when they asked at a federal inquiry who was responsible for the decommissioning, he said, well, that is for the farmer to contend with in their lease agreements. It's a swindle environmentally in regards to bird life and nature. Uh, we believe that as one raptor per year per tower will be killed by wind towers. Mr Chair, it's a swindle in economics. What other part of our economy in the New England has subsidised capacity investment schemes, which basically underwrites you even if you make a loss, even if you don't produce enough electricity? We would love that in the cattle industry, where we get paid even if we didn't produce cattle. It has government paid transmission lines, and Energy Co being a classic example of that. It has a policy where it is almost compulsory, well it is compulsory, for a, purchase, a section of that product to be purchased. It has provided policy that basically bans its competition in removing other things such as base load power. Most importantly, it's a swindle in virtue. Hospitals are virtuous, but you see them in cities. Roads are virtuous, and you see them in cities. But intermittent power precincts, which could quite ably be built off the coast of Sydney or off the coast uh, of Melbourne, um, are not built there because apparently the virtue runs out when you're inside of the city. Um, it is an is issue that the virtue doesn't go as far as getting an ironclad, an ironclad promise that any of the solar panels will have anything to do with the slave labour that constructs solar panels in Sichuan province, or that the cobalt in the in the solar panels, sorry, the, the in the solar panels doesn't come from the child labour in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. These are things that in that virtuous, swarmy present presentations we get, which are distinctly left behind. It's a swindle, Mr Chair, in the fact that so many promises are made to local communities and so little is delivered. Let's look at Glen Annis as a classic example. Basically billions invested in um, intermittent power precincts, but what's happened to the town? Has its, has its population grown? Are there new industries there? Are there new jobs there? There's only probably a handful, maybe one or two. There's no car park at the, at the intermittent power precinct because hardly anybody works there. Yet they promise so much. So why is it happening, Mr Chair? It's happening because there is a pecuniary, a massive pecuniary benefit that goes to a select few. And we can see those proponents out there at the moment. Mr Forrest, um, Chinese uh, overseas companies, multinational companies from China, from Singapore, from France, from Holland. These are the real benefits of this swindle on the Australian people and this swindle on the people of New England. And as we see on our community, bad policy makes bad politics. You've not just divided our community down the middle, you have divided them 90% to 10%, with 90% um, in some sections furious, politically furious at the lack of representation, politically furious at the, lo at the low volume that should be played out on their behalf, um, furious because they feel that they've been completely run over, and 10% who are maybe in support feel isolated and intimidated. But this carpet-bagging approach is to be seen. Small country communities and country halls going through this micromanagement so they're not properly heard, pushed to separate corners of the rooms, basically, over, basically told that everything's going to be fine, making sure that they do not get their community right to speak as one community until you enforce it 
on those, those, especially from Energy Co, coming to so-called consult with them. I've been invited to Willamette Hall and seen this in process. I've been invited to Limbri Hall and see this in process. These are good country people who've had limited experience with the highest levels of government, with the highest levels of corporations, and they've been run over. This is salt in their wounds when I see them turning up in their hired SUVs with their double-pocketed shirts and their first purchase RMs as they basically make their way trying to look, having the clobber of the bucolic. Um, and then as they've got over the people, as they've had their way, go back to the lounge at the airport fist pumping, saying what a great job they've done because they've basically belittled and rolled over people. At Gowrie, I saw landholders, I think it was Energy, 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 the Corporation Energy, saying to them that their actual land will increase in value when they're encircled with solar panels. When I uh, reproached them on this and said, that's a warrant that you have now given, so do you now promise that if a valuation is taken now and a valuation is taken later, that you will pay them the difference? Of course, they, say that they said they wouldn't. I said, well, you're lying. And uh, we are over the emotion. We don't care if, as, a, as a, a proponent, you start crying. It means nothing to us because you are hurting us so badly. We have noted, and I've noted, I uh, would also note that our family was offered the, the chance to be uh, a site for a proponent. And as the, as the Joyce family said, we are not interested in that. We produce, we produce food, we produce fibre, we don't rip off pensioners with an exacerbation of their power price. So, we, so I declare our interest in that we said no. Um, but in the discussion, other people have um, intermittent power precincts, and when we've been given, on a personal level, representations that they will change, they will change where the corridor goes, so it doesn't go over the best of our farmland, so it doesn't go over our airstrip, which I'm about to start using right now, that it doesn't go over what was clearly noted in our area as the Aboriginal uh, place, that we can clearly prove had, uh, it was historically of, an ab of Aboriginal significance, they don't care. Laws like that don't matter for them, and they continue on. Even though they've given multiple representations, we're going to change. I've just checked the map right then, and it's going exactly where it was always going to go. And that's emblematic of the arrogance of this process. Um, we have seen the uh, people in, the, in Energy Co turn up and say that um, I'm very silly in front of my wife that, that we cannot allow the media there. Well, uh, that's a bit of a problem because she's a senior columnist for The Telegraph. Um, so what we have to do, the final in insult for this is that it doesn't work. What we are seeing with intermittent power and its process as part of apparently net zero is the vast majority of the GDP and the vast majority of the population of the globe, whether it's fortunate or wrong or whatever, but they're not participating in it. <coughs> so this, the, the efficaciousness of this process is null and void. It doesn't have effect. It is not going to do anything. So why are we continuing on with it? We now have local governments. They're not going to be, there is no real promise of, of help for local governments. I don't go to areas and see that new dams are being built or new precincts are being built for the, oil, for the apparent flow in of industry that's going to happen, because it's not going to happen. What will happen is oversized, overmass vehicles will wreck the roads. What will happen is that we'll have fire risk delivered into our area. What we will have is because no one intends to, has any plan for the decommissioning of these, and might I state that the Labor Party Ombudsman, Andrew Wyatt, stated clearly about two years ago that for a, for a structurally sound one, $600,000 a tower, for structurally unsound ones, this is two years ago, $1.6 million a tower. That means if the farmer's responsible for it, we are heading towards, and I used to value land for a company called uh, QIDC, we are heading towards negative value on farmland. You will not be able to borrow against it. No one will want to buy it. And that's what we've created. No government with all their virtue, has come out and said, well, like a coal mine, we will underpin the re rehabilitation and, uh, and recommitment of that land to its former state because it knows it costs too much. So they're fobbing that off to the farmer and we've stood by and let that happen. We have done nothing about it. No private member's bill, no speech in the parliament, nothing has been happening about this. So um, my job 
uh, in politics, it's to stand up against the powerful on behalf of the powerless. And I mean that, the powerless, because that's what we are creating. We are creating ultimately a society where people cannot afford electricity. We have, in the area where I live, which is uh, one of the poorest schools in New South Wales, you can check that up, uh, people who have been pushed out of their house to live in a car because they just can't afford to live anymore. What is the virtue of that? What is the moral of that? Where is the benefit of that? How do you justify that and that a billionaire becomes wealthier or that an overseas company makes their money out of a government underwritten guarantee when the ultimate, the ultimate side of that is poor Australians are put into destitution? Is that what the virtue of this product is? Is that what the virtue of this process is? It's a disgrace. It should be scrapped. And uh, let's see if after this committee, and I wish you all the very best, I bless you with all the motivation you can have, but let's actually see, just like everything else, whether anything actually changes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.